Before we get started, I just wanted to introduce our panelists. First, to my right, we have Sean Cottrell from the SLDS State Support Team, who works with Ross on providing all of that great PTAC support to, our ver to the various districts and states and their student <coughs> privacy concerns. Uh, to the right of Sean, we have Amelia, who you've just heard talking, so I won't keep going. And then to her right, we have Diane Dorsch, Chief Technology and Information Officer at the Green Bay Area Public Schools. I also want to give a shout out because this is your last week, right? It is. So yes. congratulations. I will be retiring. <laughs> congratulations. Well, thank you. I don't know if moving over to digital promise counts as retiring <laughs> per se. Just but... as much work. <laughs> And then last but certainly not least, we have Greg Cox. He is a, a data privacy trainer with the Utah State Board of Education. So why this panel is a bit different than the rest of the, uh, the other panels that we have here. And I want Amelia to explain why she had me put it on the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Putting me on the spot there. Yes, um, I am. So as I mentioned in the state laws presentation, a big trend that we've seen over the past two legislative sessions has been school safety legislation, which absolutely makes sense. Uh, in the wake of the Parkland shooting in Florida, in the wake of many other events all over the country, school safety is top of mind. Um, and it is something that has trickled over to legislators who want to provide adequate safety measures and adequate funding for those safety measures to school districts. And in the meantime, you end up with uh, email inboxes, I'm sure, full of technologies that promise you that uh, your students will be kept safe if you just add this new app or monitoring device or add on to your existing filtering software, or whatever else it may be. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of states that have been requiring certain technologies, requiring more data sharing, haven't also baked privacy into it. So the starkest example of this is Florida, where you had last year the school safety law pass uh, where it had two uh, little known requirements. One was that uh, parents as part of registration would have to provide past mental health referrals of their child to the school. Um, as you can imagine in the one district that implemented it last year, there was a lot of parental outcry and they ended up uh, rolling that back to some extent, but it's still part of the law. It's still something districts are required to do, but they haven't gotten guidance on how to do it. So all 76 districts are doing things differently. Um, you also had the creation of a social media database that would combine social media information with social services and law enforcement data with the purpose of identifying threats. Unfortunately, um, there were not uh, privacy, uh, a privacy discussion or privacy guardrails baked into this. Um, the original sponsor said that, you know, he anticipated that the social media information that would be included would be, you know, reports, the sorts of things that you see in the wake of tragic events that say, you know, we should have done something earlier because this was a sign. Um, but we found out in an article released about three weeks ago in Education Week, you should all read it, there's a link to it in the Google Doc, that this database is going to be a lot broader than that, that information that was discussed being added to it, in addition to school records, included Medicaid information, involuntary psychiatric um, uh, referrals, uh, information, about whether someone uh, was or is a foster kid, um, whether they had been bullied or harassed due to a protected characteristic. And those last two categories ended up being in the final version of the database. Um, uh, according to the information the reporter got through Sunshine Act requests, um, and the database is supposed to go live on August 1st. Um, it's essentially creating a state database of kids who are gay, of kids who are harassed because of their religion, because of things they like, of, because of their disabilities. Um, 
a lot of these things are well meant, but operating off of stereotypes of, you know, what a school shooter is or who is dangerous in our society and doesn't actually help keep kids safe and in fact will keep kids from reporting bullying and harassment um, and requesting the accommodations that they need in order to learn. Um, Florida is obviously the starkest case, but we have seen other bills in various states around the country that also require more data sharing and uh, more adoption of surveillance. Um, and so thinking very carefully about not only what is legally available to do, because schools have very wide discretion here, but what is ethically right and what is best for kids um, is a really important discussion that I wanted to make sure was included today. So now that everyone's properly scared, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but to sort of delve in more about what this means practically, because I think that's important, I want to start with Diane. Um, as you're building your, uh, as you're vetting technology, as you're deciding what technology to include in your systems, what does that mean when someone asks you about a visitor management system or installing cameras or something like that? How do you, how do you balance the privacy interests of your students with all of these concerns that you have as a school to keep your kids safe? Yeah, and that's something that um, has hit us smack dab in the face because of all these things happening nationally, Wisconsin has really opened up a lot of funding for safety. And so school districts are writing grants then that are requesting these monies. And at that point even, uh, you know, not having someone looking out for privacy uh, can get you into trouble because you can say, well, we want this, we want that, and all those other things without that thought behind the scenes of, okay, what are we gonna do with all the data? What are, how are we gonna store it? How long are we gonna store it? What do we need to buy? Um, you know, how do we respect the rights of people uh, who are trying to enter our, our um, schools and, you know, and, and coughing up their identification and things? And it's very interesting because this is something that does not reside with the Department of Technology. Um, me being the Chief Technology and Information Officer, we handle the switches, we handle the servers, we handle the network, but in a large district like Green Bay, facilities um, manages those things. And so I guess I, what I'm saying is within your school district, you need to make sure that you have that holistic conversation because then they can go off and make all those purchases and it's the same thing that we always complain about with you know, other departments. It's like they go ahead and buy stuff and then they tell us to just make it work, right? How many of you can relate to that? Um, and you know, with our um, teaching and learning things, we have that baked in. We have a process for our procurement and we have to, um, as the Department of Technology, we have to approve those things. But for facilities, it's like because they have the safety money, because the money is there, they were given free reign on, on these things. So now, um, you know, I'm trusting that our attorney is reviewing all these things. Again, uh, we have, you know, a, a, a process in our, in our district that only the department heads can sign uh, the purchase agreements. And so as part of the procurement process, our legal counsel reads through all those agreements and she's the one then who's going to have to make that um, decision about, okay, is this gonna work or is this not gonna work? And then, of course, we always say, I ain't paying you the money until we get these things taken care of. And so that's where we are now uh, in that purchasing process. We have made a lot of purchases of video cameras and they are getting installed. Uh, and you know, we are taking a look and have had policy on uh, video, what you can release uh, for investigation, uh, who needs to be blurred out, uh, who can look at the video, all those types of things, and we're continuing on with that. But the parent ID system, um, you know, those are the conversations that we still need to have because, again, in many parts of, of um, the United States, we've got parents who are very hesitant, right, to, to um, 
bring forward their identification uh, because of some other things that could happen. And so how do we respect um, rights and privacy uh, while still keep our kids safe? So all I can say is the conversation is in the works right now. We don't have the answers, um, but as you move forward, and maybe it's happening already in your district, make sure you're included in those conversations. And that is part of the procurement process, that all those things are worked out with your providers so that um, you don't have surprises at the end. Thank you so much for that. So you mentioned that this is sort of a national <coughs> conversation coming back to you. So let's talk to the national people. <laughs> so at the federal level, I know that they've put out a report on school safety, which covers a wide variety of things. So what privacy recommendations are in there? Do they have any? Um, in the national... Uh, in the big report. I, am, I don't believe there are very specific um, guidelines put out there. There aren't. I was setting them up. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe I missed something. <laughs> So with that in mind, what other resources can districts go to for help on some of these questions? What sort of resources have PTAC put out already? Yep. So um, we have provided a lot of guidance documents around working with online service providers, right? Um, and especially, you know, if you want to engage a vendor, um, think about who's having access to that data and things like that. Um, same thing on the vendor side, model terms of service. Mm -hmm. um, we have a guidance document that kind of sets you up where it says, here's the piece that should be in there. Here's an example of what good language would be. Here's an example of bad language. And here's why that's bad language. And that's sort of the difficulty too, right? Because every different vendor you're gonna work with, um, every different service provider, they're gonna have their own little flavor of legalese added into that contractual language. So you do have to do a little bit of deciphering. Um, but there are tons of resources out there to help you guys sort of, you know, set that sort of groundwork. I um, mean, I've heard the converse, or uh, at least the term mentioned earlier, you know, best practices. Um, if you think of the law as sort of setting the foundation or, you know, the, that's like where you should start at, um, urge your folks, urge your organizations to strive to achieve those best standards or those best practices. Um, you know, go above and beyond because, you know, when you actually engage those stakeholders like the parents who are, you know, the ones expressing those concerns and things like that, you know, being able to have something you can point to, some documented language, um, but not only that, but it, um, it conveys a consistent message, you know, no matter who they're talking to within your district, um, and also um, addressing those items through policy. Um, policy is a big thing, you know, not just the big P policy, but like how are you implementing that policy too. Um, tons, of res uh, tons of template policies that we have on there. Um, data governance is also mentioned. Um, data governance is like that big umbrella where if you think about privacy and security, it sort of fits underneath governance. Um, some people hear governance and they're like, oh yeah, like we make decisions, so we have governance locked down, right? But are you involving the right people in those decisions? You know, when you're um, engaging with a, um, a camera system in your school, right? Um, generally, um, just because you've captured something on video, it's not necessarily student record, right? Some context has to apply. If I, you know, if I see on the video little Johnny walking down the hallway, he kicks a glass window and breaks it, well, now I'm going to use that video as proof that there's a disciplinary incident. Well, that's now part of a discipline record, right? So now that, that, that incident now made that be part of that record. But having those conversations and knowing where those little nuances are will really help you, um, especially if you're working with like school resource officers in your class or in your school. Um, we just released some school resource officer guidance and we're now um, really working with those groups to get the word out for how much um, information do you have access to? Are you actually school official in the annual notice of FERPA rights and things like that? So there are a lot of pieces that sort of come into play, um, but really a lot of those are undressed under that data governance umbrella and that's where I would point you guys to right away if you're sort of like, where should I start at? You go through, um, we have a checklist for data governance. We have a checklist for data security. We have a checklist for um, data breach responses and things like that. And it's really meant to have you, you know, analyze your own program. Do you have these pieces? If you don't, how should you address that? And reach out to your peers. You know, Diane Dorsch up in Green Bay, they have excellent programs. And I would assume, and sort of speaking for you, that she would love to point you guys to those and share those out with you guys, right? Because again, in the education community, we love to, you know, really share, share and be collaborative. Um, and, you know, so reach out to your peers. Um, you know, Jim Siegel uh, from Virginia, you know, again, great examples of really good practices that you can emulate or at least, you know, have something to strive for. Thank you for that. So, Greg, as a state, you're, we're seeing sort of two different things. One, uh, a lot of these new laws are getting passed 
but two, not a lot of guidance is going with it. What has been your experience at Utah with this sort of school safety uh, conversation and how your Department of Ed or your state board has been helping districts with these tough conversations? Yeah, so we're kind of in a lucky situation in the fact that when they passed the Student Data Protection Act in Utah back in 2017, they fully funded it as well, which we know that we're very lucky to have that because a lot of states don't have that backing. Uh, but we still hear it from the districts, like, we wanted the funding, not the states. It's like, well, take what you can get because other states don't have any of that. So, um, so we were really lucky in that and that it created some positions at the state level, including my position as a trainer, uh, David Soleil as an auditor, uh, our chief privacy officer, Whitney Phillips. And so we are now a part of the conversation when anything is going through the state, especially through the legislature and through board rule. And so we're, we're known now, like privacy is now a part of the conversation wherever we go. And so when they do try to pass certain things at the state level, like this last year, they had a big uh, push for school safety because of Parkland and what was going on in the national conversation. And they were trying to pass an unprecedented uh, bill that was a hundred million in funding uh, 60 million was one-time funding for hardening is what they call it, like school facilities so locks and cameras and all these other types of uh, safety you know things that you can do to a school and then 30 million of that was to was to be ongoing to provide for school resource officers and to provide for um, counselors and those different types of uh, positions which you know, it was great. It ended up not being passed. I think from the original bill of 100 million, they eventually cut it down to about 1 million, um, which was disheartening to say the least, uh, but understand kind of some of the reasonings behind that. But at least we still were able to get a few things going on where uh, at the state level, they decided they wanted to have some work between uh, like a school safety type person that would be the liaison between public safety and schools and the state, um, and then also a mental health specialist as well. So that was, you know, at least they're still thinking about that. So it was kind of nice to see that and to be a part of that conversation as well of like, well, yeah, this stuff is good, but let's talk about the privacy issues as, as well, which um, part of that funding was to go towards a database is what they were calling it. just kind of almost like Florida is how you described it, but it wasn't at all like what Florida was passing. It was more or less a tool, not really collecting new data, but just being able to organize the data that we're supposed to be getting from schools already and trying to kind of help and do those types of things. Um, but because we have our department at the state level, we are able to ask, what, what are the privacy considerations with this? Are you collecting new student data? Who are you sharing it with? Um, and come to find out that a lot of that wasn't being done like they were at Florida. So it was nice to have that conversation be like, well, we, we need to make sure that the message is clear because what you're saying is getting a lot of people scared of collecting a new database on students. Like, what does that mean? And so it's kind of rewording and uh, understanding what it is we're actually doing. So. Thank you for that. So I would like, because we have such a great panel, to open the floor for questions from the audience. And if you don't all have questions, I have plenty more. But I wanted to make sure you got them in. Yes. All right, so I'm going to rephrase this a little bit so we can get the question on video. Um, because education record doesn't necessarily neatly align with every bit of information you're collecting for a school safety goal, what happens when a parent comes to you and says, I'm very uncomfortable with this because this seems like a conduit for law enforcement actions or other sort of um, detrimental actions against my child, whether it be um, Baker acting or institutionalizing them, removing them from school, putting them in the criminal justice system. So because we're gonna start with the education record, I'll pass this to Sean first, but then I'd love for the rest of you to weigh in as well. All right, so um, you, you're absolutely right, right? Education records are, you know, about a particular student maintained by an educational agency. 
pretty broad definition there, right? So um, I mentioned context specific, but when we really think about, um, let me address videos, right? So videos are like the biggest thing. Um, we set out uh, guidance in um, December of 2017. It's called Letter to Wachter. Um, speaks about a discipline incident involving, um, I believe there are like eight students involved, six perpetrators, two uh, students were um, the victims, but there were really four perpetrators because two acted as lookouts, but they're all involved. So like, how do you really navigate like which parents would have access to that video, right? Because FERPA does say be provided access to the education records, you can't be denied access. Well, FERPA also has that little caveat, um, or you can provide enough contextual information where you're just describing what's in the video without providing the actual definition, or without actually providing the record, right? Um, so that's all spelled out in that letter to Wachter, and it, it really um, speaks or talks through like the nuances of, you know, um, and even uh, provides an example of like a, an incident on a school bus, right? School bus cameras. Well, who maintains that video on the school bus, right? Is it the district? Does that get to the district? Does that go from the written agreement from the contract with the school bus company or whether they're your own district buses, things like that, right? So it's really dependent on those nuances. Um, but when we think about like school resource officers, right? So the conduit to, to law enforcement, I, I recognize that's a big one. Um, you know, in the, in the late 90s, right, there was a big push for law enforcement officers in school facilities to back off being involved in school discipline, right? They're only there for law enforcement purposes. It's only there for, you know, to, for school safety, right, for that true definition. They're not there for, oh, you know, okay, let me, let me handle this, you know, so-and-so is acting out in class, right? Because there should be those clear separations. Um, but that's when we do have to start talking about, okay, who is maintaining it? Um, we've seen scenarios where there are schools that have the videos where there's the direct feed to the, uh, to the police department where no school officials actually having access to that, right? So now there's a record that's created about individual students, but it's not maintained by the educational agency. It's maintained by the law enforcement agency. So now those are law enforcement unit records, and law enforcement unit records are typically um, uh, administered or, or, you know, there's laws at the local level, state level, things like that, not necessarily federal level that address who has access to those, right? Um, so those are important things that you have to spell out, right? Because if you have a, a school resource officer in your building, there's probably some sort of agreement um, with the police department with what that uh, officer is going to be doing, right? What are the actions that they can take? What's their capacity? Like, what are, you know, what are they here for, right? That has to be spelled out. You don't just say, hey, we want a police officer in the school, and then, great, we're safe, because, well, what is that police officer doing, right? We don't want them to get involved in those things. And that has other implications. Um, there was a, an example of a school resource officer walking into a bathroom. He observed a male student at the um, bath, uh, at the, you know, at the um, sink um, with a bag with green leafy material in it and a little uh, medical vial in his other hand. Um, student uh, got brought to the principal's office, was placed under arrest in handcuffs, um, read his Miranda rights, and at that point the police officer searched the student's backpack, right? Um, we also have implications for uh, school officials, right, where a school official can search a student if they're on the premises. Um, there's a lot of uh, legal um, guidance and things like that on that, um, in that avenue. But once a student is placed under arrest, um, you now need a warrant or a subpoena in order to search the possessions of that student. So now when that police officer searched the student's backpack after the student was placed under arrest and found the BB gun in the kid's backpack, and now there's going to be enhanced charges because there's a firearm or something that looks like a firearm being added in, well now all of a sudden that can't be ad, uh, ad, um, uh, added as uh, evidence because, well, that wasn't a lawful search and things like that, right? So that's why it really comes down to dotting your I's and crossing your T's, having these conversations and really, you know, addressing these things proactively instead of reactively. Um, hit it at the big P, right? The policy is we're going to have, um, we're going to delineate what the role is for this resource officer who's in the school, what they have access to. Are they acting in the capacity as a school official? Does that align with our annual notice for school official as required under FERPA? Um, making sure everything has to align with the specific environment um, that we're treating those records in. So there does have to be a lot of consideration applied, um, but I think it really starts at the, at the ground level, right, with the big P. We want to protect students' privacy, but we also want to keep them safe. And we know that there are exceptions in FERPA that do sort of allow for both, right? Um, we have the uh, health and safety emergencies exception. Um, is there an articulable and significant threat that's uh, imminent and impending, you know, so that, like, hey, that we're expecting the 100-year flood, 
blood, so I want to like send the state emergency management agency all, a list of all the kids with their addresses because we're expecting that flood to happen. It's coming any day now. Well, my question is, are your feet wet? Like, is it actually flooding? Is it, you know, are there storm clouds? Like, are, are, is the water level rising? Things like that. Um, if it's not, well, it's not necessarily meeting that level of the um, uh, school safety threat and things like that. So you do have to be careful, and it does really come down to those nuances. So I, I want to add um, and, and definitely want to point people to the guidance that Sean mentioned that uh, PTAC just put out because it's really framed as FAQs. It's very much so practically what data can you share, how does FERPA interact with school safety. Um, and I really want to note when you're talking about sort of that conduit to law enforcement this is an area where schools have pretty wide discretion and, and so as with a lot of the other things I was saying a lot of this is about asking questions a lot of this is about having a policy in the first place and so for example like SROs generally are acting as school officials and as school officials under any of the FERPA exceptions uh, except for directory information you can't reshare data the SRO cannot reshare data with law enforcement colleagues. Um, he can't even share data with the other half of his brain. That's a law enforcement officer. Like there's, there, there's a very, um, there's a fairly clear line there. But a lot of that on the ground gets played out as, what instructions are they getting? Um, have they gone through FERPA training? Probably not. Um, do they know they're not allowed to share certain information with law enforcement? Uh, how have you decided that um, if they are a part of a threat assessment team, which many SROs are, how do you make sure that the folks on that team know that that information can't be disclosed for law enforcement purposes? Um, but at the end of the day, FERPA does allow really broad discretion for districts to designate what access the SRO or law enforcement officials have. Um, like you as a district could say that an SRO has full access to the student information system in order to find threats. And I think most people would say that is not acceptable. You don't wanna authorize a fishing expedition where Inevitably, the people who are going to be pulled up in that are disabled, are in some way different from their peers, um, are being identified due to explicit or implicit biases um, that the person doing conducting that expedition has. Um, and so, again, I think a lot of this is going to be less about the legal side of things. What does FERPA allow you to do or not do? Because the department's not going to second guess you if you think there's an imminent threat, but what ethically do you want to convey? What policies do you want to have in place? Have you had this conversation with your school board, with your superintendent, with others about how this information should be shared? What technology is going to be adopted? Are we comfortable with a network monitoring system that key logs everything or sends a weekly email to parents of every website a kid visits? Like, where do we want to draw lines? Um, because you can have safety by, you know, having an absolute surveillance state. And most of us, I think, don't want that to be the case in schools. It undermines trust. It, um, there are all sorts of documented harms to kids and to learning. Um, and so that's important to keep in mind. So from the district level, uh, first of all, this is why our legal counsel is busy all the time, right? Because a lot of these things are definitely communications between pupil services, legal counsel, our SROs, and understanding how all that works. Um, policy, I, I agree. I always advise go to policy first. And so making sure you have a tight policy that does uh, talk about what takes place, uh, how you do it, all those things is just going to provide a little more consistency as well. And so then it's the training. And another thing that we did with safety grants is there was a lot of money put into um, 
into professional learning. And that's really hard to do with a large school district when you've got many staff members who are, you know, overtaxed anyway. Um, and so our district put that into a series of videos and lessons that we inserted into safe schools. Do some of you have that where um, it's a it's a vehicle that can allow you to deliver content to your staff and then you can keep track of who has done it and who hasn't. Um, and if they don't do it, then you know, watch the videos, answer the questions, then they get the nag emails you know, until you finally break down and do it. Um, and so everyone had a whole school year to, do, to get through all the training. Because again, it's these types of things that are popping up that are, we are all saying, hey, we don't, we don't really know how to deal with this. Let's all get consistent about it. Let's all understand and speak the same language. And you have to do that first before any of those things. I, I can't really um, talk to you know, how that interaction goes between uh, pupil services, legal counsel, um, SRO, police. Uh, in, I, I can't really speak specifically to that and just that I know that they communicate um, often on it. Uh, they do build uh, procedure and things. It's not quite policy, but this is what we do. Um, this is what takes place first, second, and third. So um, that everyone is pretty lockstep on that consistently through the district and using those vehicles like um, you know the professional learning so everyone is talking the same language is a really good place to start. And just to echo Diane, like training, definitely well <laughs> worth the investment, not only because it's job security for me, but um, it, it's just the best thing you can do. It's the number one thing that's going to help people like understand their role and what they can or can't do. Um, I was just going to add to that, like in not just the, the school resource officer, but also there's other things within <laughs> FERPA and some different exceptions like We've had the question about juvenile justice systems and stuff like that that we that we have to be aware of as well, and to understand like Ross was saying earlier that you know FERPA is the floor and you know a lot of other national laws are the floor and states sometimes decide that you know we want to beef this up a little bit and Utah has done that in several cases especially with juvenile justice systems and so it's important that we understand the national like responsibilities, but also state and also state board, you know? Uh, and also, as Diane was saying, with local policies, what are you gonna do? Um, so just trying to get all those ducks in a row sometimes is, you know, it's, it's, it's a task that's really hard to do, but um, once you do that, make sure everyone's trained on it. Thank at you. least we're having the conversations about it. Yeah. You know, it's unfortunate that bad things have to happen in order to force this to, to occur, but um, I'm glad that we're starting with those conversations. So I hope you are too. So I saw a question from Robert. Yes. So to sort of make this a packageable question and hopefully get it answered soonish so we can feed you all, <laughs> um, I'm actually gonna start with Diane because you're the one on the ground. How do you communicate with your parents about your school safety issues? And how do you do it in a way, or what's the way to minimize blowback and maximize community investment? So one, you're making good decisions, and two, you have, you have an understanding of your community of what you're going to be doing. Well, our Board of Education is a great vehicle for that, right? And they are the community. And so uh, with these funds that are coming through, uh, the Board of Education is going to want to report on how are you spending the money and what are you doing. And so those would be things then that would go to the board and the board would usually have questions about that then. And that would be taken care of at a work session. We would like to know, you know, how this is being spent, what you're doing, and, um, you know, how are you training your staff? And then the discussion from that part is being videoed, just like we're being videoed now. And the expectation is then that it's out on, in public so that parents can watch it. So, you know, it would be great to have a press release and those types of things. We have a website um, and we, again, with the transparency part, if the topic comes up of parents saying we have a concern about this, we do have a parent group that, a parent advisory group that our superintendent 
has, and I have spoken to that group as we've talked about um, responsible use policies. And it's interesting to hear parents' concerns uh, because they're quite different from maybe what we're seeing inside the school. Um, but parents can bring forward the questions. We've also then had talks with our employees about it. Uh, and, you know, that's where you'll see some questions, especially with all these cameras up. You know, are they going to be watching me? Are they going to be listening to me? Are they going to check to see if I'm doing my work? Those types of things. Um, and, and so those get brought through, again, the structures that we have because uh, we, we do have organizations that represent our clerical group or our teaching group and things like that. So um, those conversations take place, again, within the framework where we have communication inside a district and that's where those things would arise um, and so you know otherwise if if it's not brought up it's like we we do our business <laughs> we expect people to watch it on on um, on our board of education you know channel that we have and you're right do we wait for things to happen yet yeah, we stuff happens but we always try to make sure we've got policy in place and try to anticipate things so I hope that helps a bit. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.